nine o'clock. So on behalf of the Internet Archive, I would like to welcome you to Enduring Legacy, the Million Book Project Turns 20. That's right, in 2001, a Mellon professor named Dr. Raj Reddy had an audacious vision. He launched something called the Universal Digital Library, better known today as the Million Book Project. And Dr. Reddy believed that we had within our graphs the ability to master the technology, the economics, the legal regimes, and the social agreements to bring one million books online and make them accessible to everyone. So today on the 20th anniversary of that project, we're gonna be looking back. We're also going to be hearing from other projects that were inspired by the Million Books Project. We will see what the impact of bringing millions of books online can be. And perhaps most importantly, we're gonna take a look into the future and we're gonna prognosticate in 10 years, where will digital books and digital libraries be? Hello, my name is Wendy Hanamura and I am the Director of Partnerships at the Internet Archive. Uh, we are, for those of you who don't know us, a big nonprofit digital library with millions and millions of collections and items that are free for all. And while we may best be known, be known best for our um, Wayback Machine, that archive of the web, we also have collections of 228 million digital texts, and that includes 4.6 million digital books. So, you know, working on this event made me wonder, who first conceived of the ebook? And in modern times, take a look at this. In 1936, it was H.G. Wells. He wrote this book, The World Brain. And in it, H.G. Wells posits a, a, a world in which there's a connected, free, global encyclopedia that brings about world peace. Then, next in 1945, we have Vannevar Bush. He described Memex, the global brain that would sit there right on top of your desktop, very influential with early computer scientists. Then, in 1971, we see Michael S. Hart, who launches the Gutenberg Project. At this point, he's just a student, and he reaches into his backpack, and he pulls out a copy of the Declaration of Independence, he digitizes it and he puts it online. And this is what is considered by many the first public ebook. In 2001, enter Dr. Raj Reddy, who launches the Universal Digital Library, also known as the Million Book Project. This would also be a global project with partnerships in India and China, funding from the National Science Found Foundation. But the reaction back in 2001 might surprise you. Many people said, well, who in the world would want to read a book on a computer? Today, I think the reaction is, who wouldn't? So it is now my honor to introduce to you the creator, the founder of the Universal Digital Library. Many think of him as the father of modern AI. He's a Turing award-winning computer scientist, a professor at Carnegie Mellon. And peers will tell you that nobody is more optimistic than Raj Reddy, who really believes in the power of technology to solve some of the world's biggest problems. Here with a brief history of his project, please welcome Dr. Raj Reddy. Good morning. I first met Brewster 20 years ago through our mutual friend, John McCarthy, my advisor at Stanford. The three of us met at a cafe in San Mateo because that was midway between San Francisco and Palo Alto so that everybody only had to travel equal distance. Given our mutual interest, uh, Brewster and I, we, we started collaborating on digitizing books on the Million Book Project. And in 2003, uh, Brewster and Mary Austin um, joined us on a digital library tour of scanning centers in India. And uh, soon after that trip, I gave a talk. And uh, this is the talk I, I was able to extract it. I'll quickly go through it just so that you have some background. 
So the million book, and go back to the previous slide, please. The million book project uh, had at Carnegie Mellon had three pe four people. And besides me, that's in the middle, Jaime Carbonell, Max Shamos, and Gloriana St. Clair. And, um, and we had a picture, not at that time, maybe 10 years later, with holding books in the library of different books. And uh, so this is the slide I was able to find. Next slide, please. So the cha grand challenge was to create access to, universal access to all authored works, all published works online. They don't have to be published. They have to be creative works, instantly available in any language, anywhere in the world, searchable, browsable, navigable by both humans and machines. Next slide, please. We knew even then, this is like trying to build the Great Wall of China. It is not going to be done in one year or 10 years. It might take 100 years, but we have to make a beginning somewhere. And this was the thing. And, and the interesting thing, of course, is uh, the Million Book Project did not come out of thin air. Let me go to the next slide, which shows a video that was made in 1997. Can we roll the video, please? Go ahead. The goal of the Universal Library is to make all authored works created since the beginning of time instantly available to anyone, anywhere in the world, in any language. Let's now take a look at some of the materials contained in the Universal Library and how to access them. We're looking at a high-resolution color image of a cactus flower from an antique botanical print. The original of this print is rare and fragile and is normally inaccessible to human beings. But through the Universal Library, it can be made available to researchers all over the world. To look at other material in the Universal Library, we just go back to the home page, looking at a different book. Here's one, for example, books by Charles Dickens. We can look at the full text of Oliver Twist and instantaneously access any chapter of the book. Begin reading, print the book out, whatever we'd like to do with it. Through the Universal Library, we can access newspapers from all over the world. Here, for example, from the different continents, we can access a Japanese newspaper, the Japan Times. These are today's headlines, November 4th, 1997. If we want to look at a particular article, I just click on it and begin reading the full text from the Japan Times. Through the Universal Library, we can actually listen to music. Here, for example, some works by Mozart. Stop there. Uh, this goes on. The link is there on the thing. And stop. One this. of the more yeah. intriguing. So let's go to the next slide. So by 2007, uh, we had two about um, two million books were scanned in India and China, and Google has started a massive effort to scan books. Amazon and in Google started providing access to digital books but not free as envisioned in, by us earlier. Undaunted, Rooster kept on spreading the gospel of universal access to all knowledge. Today, the open library has over 5 million books and worthy of our admiration and support. Way to go, Rooster. Okay, so next slide, please. So I'll quickly go through a whole bunch of books. You can see the uh, cover page here of uh, Rigveda. Next, next book, please. And this one is about wave theory that was published in 1823. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a Sanskrit book about 
from Kalidasa, you know, poem, poet, poems published in 1927. Next slide, please. It is an 1875 book on gems, jewels, coins, and medals. Next slide, please. It is a book on, in Tamil uh, about, um, I can't even pronounce it, Mudalayaram Mulayam, and published in 1909. Next slide, please. It is, here is an Urdu book, not, not Arabic, it's Arabic script, but Urdu uh, by, by, you know, published in 1919. Ne next slide, please. Notice we've been picking mostly books, but we know are out of copyright because that they are pre-1923. And here's a book on 1876 um, in Arabic. Next slide, please, on metrology. Here is a book in Telugu uh, going back to 1912. Next slide, please. Here is a book in Canada going back to, we don't have the year here. I think it is there and the, probably the next page. Next slide, please. Uh, here is a book um, about the fauna of British India, Ceylon and Burma, published in 1929. Next slide, please. And here's a book on Harijan, 1873. Next slide, please. And finally, the book on structure of molecules in French, which was in one of the Indian libraries when that we were scanning. Next slide, please. So the research challenges we face, we still face, are how do we provide access to billions of people who might be accessing such public libraries like the one Brewster has created? And how do we create a easy to use interface for billions who speak many different languages? And then how do we create a multilingual information retrieval system and translation and summarization facilities so that if I'm trying to read a French book, uh, I, you know, the, an automatic translation would appear on my screen, you know, in my local language. All of these are still research problems. I'm hoping, uh, you know, people at Google will solve them. They ha already have solutions to many of these, but the issue is to kind of make it broadly available. Next slide, please. And so the policy challenges are not only how do you deal with the copyright problem, but namely 5% 5, 5 of the books are out of copyright for sure. 92% of the books we can access now are out of print and in copyright. And only 3% are in print and in copyright. That means only about 3% of all the books are available on Amazon catalog today if we want to buy it on Kindle. And the rest of the books are not. And so we need a number of you know, policy mechanisms to deal with it. I don't have time to go through them and including compulsory licensing and uh, digital submissions uh, of national archives. So basically, anyway, this was a, a, a talk I, we gave in 2003. So it's not as though we have solved all these problems. We still have to solve many of these problems, but I'm happy to have this opportunity to share uh, the early beginnings of this project with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. What an amazing collection of languages and books. And thank you for not stopping, but continuing to think about what the policy issues are that need to be solved as well. Well, I think the question is, what came next? What came after the Million Book Project? Well, the next big project at scale was Google Books which started in 2004. Back in around 2010, Google estimated that there are 130 million books in print of all languages. And by 2017, Google had digitized about 25 million of them. Here to talk about this outsized project and this outsized goal is none other than Vint Cerf. You may know him as the father of the internet, for his early work in ARPANET, but he is also the vice president and chief internet evangelist of Google, posing some of the biggest questions today in his talk, Desirable Properties of Digital Libraries. Please welcome Vint Cerf. 
Thanks so much, Wendy. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you on talking about uh, this particular challenge. And I, I want to uh, acknowledge Raj Reddy's pioneering uh, efforts in this space, which continue to this day. Uh, Google has continued to, uh, to scan books, uh, primarily in relation to libraries that have made books available for scanning and also arrangements with publishers. Uh, those books that are out of copyright uh, are fully accessible. Those which are still in copyright have to be negotiated as to how much of the book is available. But the important thing is that they are discoverable. That is to say, those books that are, have been scanned uh, are uh, searchable and full text is searchable, which means it's possible to discover uh, that the, what's in the books and might be relevant. Uh, OCLC and others uh, have. Uh, have data about where books are in various libraries, so this assists the users in finding them if they don't have uh, direct access. I'd like to speak, however, to some of the challenges that go along with the ones that Raj has already outlined. Uh, the most important one, uh, honestly, is that uh, the fact that something is digital does not give it immortality. Uh, and in fact, all of us have experienced exactly the opposite with various media that don't exist uh, or readers for which don't exist anymore. An example of this uh, might be the three and a half inch floppy or the five and a quarter inch floppy, or for that matter, uh, CD-ROMs. You know, laptops are being made without CD-ROM readers anymore. Uh, then we have DVDs and Blu-ray and who knows what comes next. There are hard external hard drives which I thought would be a pretty strong solution to the problem of capturing and, and preserving information. And so I realized that the physical connectors to those external hard drives might no longer be supported. Uh, if you've watched the way in which the USB interface has changed over time uh, and you've grown around trying to find various and sundry adapters to make things continue to work. So preservation is gonna be a challenge. And just copying into new media isn't, isn't enough either because you need software in order uh, to actually uh, interpret and, and render or, or interact with digital content. And let's not get totally trapped only in the um, static representation of material because an awful lot of digital content now requires software to interpret so you can interact with it, not simply to read it, but possibly to exercise it, for example, a spreadsheet. So uh, we have a real preservation problem here. It could translate into uh, requiring um, us to emulate old hardware to run old operating systems, run old applications that will allow us to correctly interpret and interact with an older piece of digital content. So, that's one area of, of major concern. The second thing, which I'm, I don't feel I fully uh, have appreciated is that the digital uh, objects or digital books do not have the same properties either under the law or technically as a physical book does. With a physical book, I can resell it, for example. It's not clear how that works in the digital versions. Uh, I can uh, throw it away, burn it up. Well, I can certainly throw a digital copy away. Uh, but I can do a, a variety of things, annotate, for example, the physical copy, sometimes annotation of a digital copy is harder. Uh, I can loan it uh, to someone. It's not 100% clear how to loan a digital copy, especially under some regimes where those copies are under the control of a third party. Uh, so that's a huge set of issues. Uh, Raj has already pointed out uh, some important problems about registration. I just want to emphasize that when we abandon the requirement to register things that we wanted to protect with copyright, uh, we uh, lost an enormously important source of information. For example, who owns the copyright to something? What if it's been transferred? What if you want to find the person or party that owns the copyright for purposes of negotiating access to a work? By, by simply saying um, copyright in here adheres or inheres in the person who produced the, the work and you don't need to register it, you lose a great deal of important metadata uh, about these works and to make them uh, more useful, more discoverable, uh, and, uh, and in particular, uh, able to uh, negotiate access uh, to these things. So it feels to me as if we have a lot of work to do just to add uh, to that 
there's another uh, young guy named Frode Hedlund, who is uh, a protege of uh, the late Douglas Engelbart. And he's been spending a lot of time building new tools for interacting with text. And I, I want to overemphasize, if I can, the extraordinary value of having text in digital form, which means all the power of computing suddenly becomes available for the purposes of consumption, production, and use of that textual material to say nothing of allowing people to collaborate in the creation of that content as we would do, for example, with Google Docs. Well, I could go on and on uh, in this. Uh, I think the important message from my point of view is that there is a huge amount of room to improve the utility of digital works and that it's time for us to put our heads together to find a way to create digital libraries and archives that are far more useful than, uh, than what we have today. And I look forward to participating in that as does Google. Thank you, Vint. We're gonna come back to you and to all the panelists um, later on because we wanna hear what you think about the future of digital books as well. But um, now I wanna move on to our next panelist. And you know, I learned yesterday that um, from Erica Linke, who is the librarian of Carnegie Mellon University. And she said in her talk yesterday that back in 2001, when Dr. Reddy proposed the Million Book Project, the library world's reaction was unrealistic. But one major academic library stepped forward and that was the University of Toronto, then under the leadership of Carol Moore. She said, let's do it. Let's digitize our collections in the public domain. And back in 2005, our next speaker was still a young student. She was actually digitizing the books themselves as her job. And uh, she got her degrees and she has experienced every step of the process since then. Today, our next speaker is the Special Collections Projects Librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries. Please welcome Liz Rodolfo with her talk from both sides of the desk, University of Toronto Digitization History and Perspectives. Welcome, Liz. Thanks so much for having me at this wonderful celebration. Uh, so I've been a rare book librarian at the University of Toronto's Fisher Library for the past 10 years. Uh, but before that, I worked at the IA Scanning Center in its early days as a, as a scanner and later a metadata specialist and a supervisor. Um, this room that you can see in the picture in the background is the rare book library. And when we give tours, a common question is, is this all online yet? Uh, and so we always have to answer that we're we're doing some work, but it's a very complicated question. Uh, some background at the University of Toronto Libraries. Uh, so we're the fourth largest library system in North America and the largest academic library system in Canada. Um, the Rare Book Library has over 700,000 volumes and there are over 12 million print volumes in the U of T library system. There were some explorations uh, and studies into digitization in the 1990s as everyone was interested in what it uh, might be able to do for us. Uh, there was a question of balancing the needs of the scientific community of faculty members and the university administration who all had different opinions about what direction digital collections and tools should go. In the early 2000s, the university planned some digitization projects with an in-house um, in-house digitization studio. And the early sites focused on a lot of the material held at the Rare Book Library where I work, which is unique uh, Canadian material, uh, such as the material related to the discovery of insulin at the University of Toronto. Um, an interesting uh, note from former chief librarian Carol Moore is that one of the earliest, most popular digitized items was a Canadian book of 19th century knitting patterns. In 2004, the library joined a project with two scribes at the Kelly Library at St. Michael's College, planning to digitize all of the works of Cardinal John Henry Newman to create a complete virtual digital collection of Newman's works. Um, I began collaborating with the U of T more generally to try to find ways of digitizing books quickly and efficiently. And the special collections libraries brought some material to these machines for early uh, testing. 
The first scanning machines like the one you see on the left were not ideal for rare material uh, because of the amount of contact that they had with the, with the pages. Around the same time, I answered an advertisement on Craigslist for a contract book scanner as a new scribe uh, was heading to the University of Toronto and needed uh, operators. And the pace of digitization rapidly increased from that time on. There were many reasons to participate in digitization initiatives at that time, uh, from donors wanting to have their archival collections digitized uh, to faculty and staff wanting to create curate, curated collections uh, for online uh, teaching. Uh, many institutions were being approached for partnerships, but uh, Chief Librarian Carol Moore at the time uh, insisted that it was more important to have um, free and open access to the material and uh, that that would be ongoing. So digitization through the Internet Archive meant that the library was encouraging the greatest possible degree of access to the materials. Digitization also promised to help with the ever present um, consideration of space uh, as material that was low use could be scanned and sent off site and make more space in the library for student space and for new collections. Rare material has special considerations. Um, so uh, existing staff would have to find uh, the resources to figure out workflow. We had to consider metadata um, and security. And at first buy-in was difficult as far as the, the usefulness and permanence of these kind of uh, digital projects. Um, the lower cost helped to convince people to participate in the project, but there were also questions of how to handle things that are special to rare materials, such as uh, books that go um, you know, right to left, books with fold-out maps and diagrams, books that are bolted so their pages have not been opened, and material with annotations. Also, security and climate control were an issue. The books have to leave the rare book library. Uh, to go into a, a building that does not have um, humidity and temperature controls, are they going to be uh, damaged forever? Uh, or are they going to survive the process of digitization unharmed? But many of these questions were answered over the years. And so from the slow pace of 267 uh, Fisher titles digitized in the first year, um, we progressed to tens of thousands in the following year. By 2008, there were 23 scribes running at um, two different shifts uh, on Robert's library. And by 2010, we had reached the milestone of 250,000 books uh, scanned. At that time, I was an evening shift supervisor and part of a, a community who really were very proud of what they did. And we hosted countless tours of international academics and librarians uh, curious about the technology and very excited about the projects. We digitized major collections such as government documents and Canadian literature, Haggadot uh, archival manuscript donations, and material from science and medicine uh, collections. There were many changes and developments uh, in technology workflow and processes at my time at IA, uh, but a lot of it um, encouraged me to pursue my degree, and so I went for my uh, my master's in 2010 while still working at IA. Part of it was participating in special international projects such as uh, the Balinese Manuscript Digitization Project. 10 years on, there are currently about 426,000 books from the University of Toronto uh, on IA. Um, the experience of working through the process was extremely helpful and these materials are still very useful to this day. In normal times, we would reference the works on IA uh, for teaching and reference. Uh, we would also do outreach using the digitized material, but it was especially important during the pandemic when we um, kept uh, students engaged with uh, rare materials through helping with assignments, using internet archive material, creating at-home transcription projects uh, using the IIIF offerings on IA and creating digital exhibits um, on Omeka using the IIIF um, offerings on IA. So I scanned and touched, participated in the work of over 30,000 volumes at my time at the Internet Archive, and I'm extremely proud to have my name attached to them. At every teaching session, we're guaranteed to reference these materials and continue to um, bring as much as possible to be scanned and shared widely. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I just want to 
uh, reiterate that if you go to the Internet Archive and you search for the University of Toronto Libraries, you get more than 400,000 digitized books that have been done in this process by people like Liz over the course of many, many years. And yes, during COVID and when all the libraries were shut down and the schools were shut down, this is when we heard from teachers and professors and students uh, who were so grateful that libraries like the University of Toronto had done this work. Well, moving on, I get to introduce uh, someone I know quite well. And I thought, how shall I introduce my boss, Brewster Kale? And I thought, you know, sometimes a picture says a thousand words. This is the picture that I wanted to show you. This is Brewster and his son, Caslon, in 2002. And you have to understand the Universal Digital Library, the Million Books Project was just starting and people were wondering, why would you even want to digitize millions of books? So Brewster in his unique and nimble way, he created a fleet of internet archive bookmobiles. You see there's a satellite right there on the top so it can access any book that was in the internet archive. And he and his son and others drove this across the country, stopping in community after community, evangelizing the need for digital books because they had a little printer. So if you wanted a book, he would print out on demand a public domain book for children who didn't have large collections of books. And he drove this bookmobile all the way to the Supreme Court where the seminal copyright case of Eldred versus Ashcroft was being litigated. So to me, this picture kind of epitomizes how Booster will put the technology, he will put the passion, he will put the money, and he will tackle some of the biggest legal issues in order to fulfill the mission of the Internet Archive, which is universal access to all knowledge. It is my honor to introduce to you the founder, the digital librarian of the Internet Archive, Brewster Kale. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. And this is this is a tremendous gathering. Um, and, and Liz, for actually doing the real work of the, uh, of the actual getting these things online, which is not all just turning pages and taking photographs as you've, as you've outlined. And thank you to everyone. I wanna say one thing. Rod Dreddy was right. Um, bringing our history into the internet and into the present is important, right? A lot of people look to just building the future. Let's just build robots, whatever, you know. But no, let's go and make sure that we bring our full history, everything we've ever published online and to this next generation and generations to come. Technically, uh, we've seen it, it isn't easy. Uh, legally has been uh, one of the big challenges of this. Um, and uh, uh, Raj has never shied away from trying to take uh, the right stand and, and, and all of this. Um, and it wasn't easy to get people to understand, as Wendy pointed out, in early 2000s, why you'd even want to go and digitize a book. Um, they, they, there are very few people that just said, oh, yeah, I, there are many people, most people said, I will never read a book on a screen. Never, ever. Will never happen. Um, and so we had to go and try to demonstrate why. Um, and so, yes, these bookmobiles were really terrific as a mechanism of showing, okay, well, maybe you want to print it back out again. Um, and we made these in India, in Egypt, uh, in Uganda, um, to go and demonstrate the value of having access to the great libraries that really was not uh, available um, at, at all in those, in those realms. And also to try back home in the United States, where there was really not a shortage of printed books, mostly, um, to people in the legal profession of why this endless extension of copyright and the extensions and the uh, lawsuits against libraries that were have been continuous uh, from the publishing and the author um, uh, lobbyists, why um, are those not necessarily in uh, what we need as a country, uh, as learners that are more and more now digital learners. So what did the uh, Internet Archive do? Well, we helped the, um, the Indian and the Chinese efforts. Um, we bought 100,000 books from uh, uh, Kansas City Public Library and sent them to India when they were running short on books to, uh, to digitize. That was fun. We employed people in India to, to, to keep going in the, in the Chinese efforts. Uh, we were working with them uh, up until just a few years uh, ago. 
but wanted to do things in the United States and in Europe and in the rest of the Americas. So back in 2004, I stood on a stage at uh, CNI and I said, okay, Raj Reddy has shown us that the Chinese and digitized uh, Indians can digitize books. Can we build it here? If we build it here, will you come? And this Liz um, was, was very much involved in this. And the only person that really stood up and went forward was Carol Moore from the University of Toronto, uh, the fourth largest library in North America, and said, let's do this. Um, and working with them over the years, um, we basically figured out how to go and design and build a book scanner that would work for librarians uh, handling their, uh, their rare materials in the ways that they wanted to uh, do it. So it started in 2004, we built our own scanners, and we've been running with these for the last 15 years. In 2008, we started buying ebooks. We found that most publishers would not sell us ebooks. Hasn't changed. Um, so there's real problems with the born digital. So we started um, really doubling down and digitizing more and more physical books. Um, we started lending digitized books in 2011 with the Boston Public Library in the forefront to try to move into the uh, modern book era. So do it. So if you physically own a book that's not circulating, you digitize it and lend it one reader at a time, just like a library. Um, 80 libraries have joined um, this program. And then in 2018, a group of lawyers came together um, to go and find absolutely under United States law, all of this um, completely uh, makes sense to digitize and lend books in something they uh, called controlled digital lending. So now it has a name. Uh, we started in 2011 and in uh, 2018, it had a name of controlled uh, digital lending. Now, um, Harvard, Princeton, Georgetown Law, all sorts of um, uh, libraries have picked up on this. Uh, hundreds of libraries now do uh, control digital lending. Vendors are adding it to their packages. But it wasn't so clear cut. Um, and it's still not clear cut because four commercial publishers decided to sue the Internet Archive to try to stop controlled digital lending. Um, and to boot, they're demanding that we destroy two million digitized books. So a digital book burning. Um, we'll see how this all turns out. Um, but it's kind of distressing that even um, the, the fights that Google uh, were dragged through for years and years um, of digitized books is still going on, um, which is, um, I think we should be looking a little bit more towards the future. And if we've ever wondered why you'd want digital books, the year 2020 told us why. The global pandemic hits. Every library in this country shuts down, school libraries, public libraries, college libraries. And, and we start getting calls from professors, teachers, homeschoolers, desperate to find some way in their Zoom classrooms to bring um, books to kids. We spring into action, tell them about the, um, the lending systems, um, extend the lending systems to the books that are in their uh, physical collections. Um, and it makes a huge, huge, on the ground difference towards making um, uh, uh, kids able to learn and continue during a pandemic that now doesn't seem to it's ever going uh, to end. But let me get back to Raj's call. Could we do millions of books with the scanners we built? Well, the, finding the source of the books wasn't easy. We found a few ways. Um, we started the uh, University of Toronto was great. Um, and then we started getting books from lots of other libraries. We got all the way up to 500 libraries, but basically mostly the pre-1923 um, books. With, and we got $10 million in funding from Microsoft, which we're very grateful for to really get this whole thing off. Dozens of scanning centers in three continents, including the Library of Congress, Boston Public Library, University of California. But we wanted the modern books, to, um, and it was difficult to get these those. So we turned to a used bookseller called Better World Books. And today, Better World Books, now owned by a nonprofit, is donating books that were once deaccessioned by libraries to another library, our library. And um, they donated 1.8 million books last year. We're now digitizing over a million books a year, um, and um, some of which 
are um, many of which are from the Better World books, which we want to say thank you to them, but also all the libraries that deaccession into Better World books. Just last month, the National Library of New Zealand decided to donate 600,000 books from their collections. These are books from the 1960s, 1990s that New Zealand wanted to get online. No publisher is likely to bring these online, um, and they were just sitting in an uh, offsite repository. But, um, but I believe, and Raj has always known, that there's value in those books. Today, there, um, there are a few publishers, very few indie publishers that we should reinforce and that are selling eBooks, like really selling them, not just licensing them when some weird um, uh, disappearing act. Um, because the licensing doesn't work for libraries for long-term preservation or access, or I would say even for people's personal collections. So I think we need to get back to purchasing eBooks and uh, support library uh, publishers and authors um, such as Brickhouse that are selling them. Now, thanks to Raj and his inspiration, we now have 4.6 million books, either downloadable because they're in the public domain, um, or 2 million um, that are in the lending library. And we're going to keep going because our goal has always been universal access to all knowledge. Legally, we can do it. Technically, we can do it. And in economic uh, and legal uh, approaches, we can do it. The motto of the Internet Archive, universal access to all knowledge, is cribbed from Braj Reddy. He, he wrote a report um, to the president in 2001 that was titled Universal Access to, All, to Human Knowledge. And so we cribbed that title with attribution. Thank you, Raj, um, uh, for giving the motto to uh, the, the Internet Archive. In the next segment, uh, we're going to show some of uh, what gets unleashed when you have millions and millions of books that are easy to, um, to play with and in digital form. Raj, thank you uh, to you and to all that have followed you. Thank you, Brewster. Well, as Brewster mentioned, let's turn our attention now to the second part of our program, which is about the impact. What can happen when you have millions of books online? What kind of machine learning? Search within the book, uh, link data, what can happen? So I wanna show you just a couple of things from Google. They took those 25 million plus books and they're creating tools like this Ngram. Yeah, I encourage you to go down this rabbit hole because you can spend a lot of time, but you can select a date range. I selected last night, 1800s to roughly today. And I, you can put in terms to see how often do those terms appear in these 25 million plus books. So I put in Homer, Chaucer and Shakespeare. And as you see, back in 1800, Homer was really referred to and revered quite, quite a bit more than Shakespeare or Chaucer. But over time, Shakespeare has ascended. And today, in 2019, Shakespeare far outpaces any mentions of Chaucer or Homer. So I want to also do a, a very dangerous thing. I'm going to try and do a live demo for you. Uh, and that live demo is something called Google Talks to Books. So hang on one second. Um, I have to actually go back because I am ill prepared for this live demo. And I want to bring up Google Talks to Books. And if, if you're on a computer, I want to encourage you to do the same thing because this is kind of like magic. They are using, there you go. They are using what they call experimental AI, and Raj, you know AI better than anyone, uh, across the Google Books corpus. And I'm glad to see in chat that we have some Google Books folks with us in this audience, so maybe they can tell us more. But it allows you to ask questions of these books, and, and not just kind of factual questions, but let's put in something kind of philosophical. What is the best way to fall in love? Really, you can ask it anything and it'll give you some pretty interesting results. So you see, drawing from these books, it tells you what 25 million books has to say about falling in love, including this one. I love this. Wear clothes that make you feel confident and sexy. Listen to music that makes you daydream about falling in love and per put on perfumes or romantic and intoxicating scents. There you have it. 
that is the best way to fall in love, according to Google Talk to Books. But those are just a few ways that we can explore the corpora of millions of books. And our next speaker has done, in many ways, something much more profound. When Google digitized its books, where did it, those books come from? Well, they came from libraries. So it came to be uh, felt strongly that a library-led organization needed to steward those books, to make those books available to the students and professors and communities from which they had come. That organization is called Hati Trust. And Mike Furlow, who is going to address you next, is the executive director of Hati Trust. Now, Hati Trust now represents 190 plus libraries, academic libraries, across 230 campuses. But as he will tell you, perhaps the most profound impact of all of these millions of books online has been for those with disabilities that impact reading. So here to tell you about the impact of Hati Trust and those books is Mike Furlow. Thank you so much, Wendy. And I'm gonna to try to get my screen shared here. If you'll get, bear with me for one second. Great, awesome. So uh, first thing I wanna do is thank you, Wendy and Chris and Brewster and everyone else for extending an invitation to be here. It's, it's really uh, a privilege to join all of you to honor Raj Reddy and to reflect on the impact of mass digitization over the last couple of decades. Um, I'm gonna talk about how Mass digitization has transformed access to collections. I'm gonna talk about how this has led to some kinds of radical inclusivity uh, and also how it helps us understand or can help us understand uh, acts of omission in our culture. Um, when, when I first started in libraries about 25, almost 30 years ago, God help me, uh, you know, digitization was very slow going. Uh, the Million Book Project was kind of out there for us is like, wow, really a million books, but it wasn't so far removed from reality that it couldn't be inspiring. Uh, and I really appreciate being here today with someone who has helped inspire so much change over, over the years. Um, first thing I want to do is just kind of highlight one fact for us. Um, there are tens of millions of digitized books available on the internet now compared to uh, what we had years ago. Many of these are born digital, many more are being converted from print copies. Uh, and this is really a human accomplishment. It's a human accomplishment that represents decades, if not centuries, of intellectual labor, of physical labor to steward and preserve these items so that they may eventually end up on a scanning bed and then presented to you. Before they're presented to you, there have been thousands of people who have turned billions of pages to make these books available for you to read online. And so the next time you're at Internet Archive or Google or Hottie Trust, just think for a moment and thank the person who helped turn the pages so that you're able to take a look at these books today. Now, Hadi Trust itself, the, book, the organization I work for, we, as Wendy said, we steward about 17 and a half million digitized books, mostly from Google, but not exclusively. Uh, and we do this on behalf of the libraries that originally acquired them made the, and made them accessible. Really, our job has been to find ways of making the results of mass digitization more useful for as many people as we can. Now, we were founded with three specific goals in mind. One was to create scalable human or not human, uh, scalable infrastructure that could be uh, used to preserve digitized materials. Secondly, use that so it becomes a platform for access to make these materials relevant and accessible uh, to support directly scholarship and education, but also general use. Uh, works and Hadi Trust are available uh, for reading public domain works for reading uh, beyond the membership. Uh, and then thirdly, use that aggregation as an opportunity to tackle really big problems, really big libraries we're wrestling with and really couldn't solve on their own. I'm going to talk about two of those. One is opening the library collections to sight impaired readers, and then secondly, making the collection available for computationally uh, intensive analysis. The Where I'd like to start in thinking about this, though, is to just remind you of something, that for most of our history, books were produced for a very specific audience, people who can read and people who can see. And even as literacy expanded, access for the sight impaired has, has more or less lagged. Um, even today, the one of the five laws of library science, every person in their book simply doesn't hold true if you're blind or sometimes or print disabled. There are technologies that make it possible, but the commercial marketplace has lagged behind making these available over the years. Now, 
this started changing about 40 years ago when digitized books started to become made available for, for blind readers. In the 90s, we saw the Americans with Disability Act become law. We saw the Chafee Amendment to the Copyright Act make clear that digitizing books for blind users was not a violation of copyright. But the market still did not follow, and accessible books had not been produced in significant quantities. So if you were an educational institution with an imperative to support students with a disability, you had to scan and produce your own versions for them. And this was slow going. Uh, not only that, there were many people who had a need here. The scale was, was enormous. Uh, when we were founded in 2008, about just under 11% of the student population in higher education in the United States had a disability. And over almost 90% of these institutions reported having students enrolled. Now, two years later, in 2010, Hadi Trust held about 10 million digitized works, which were then could be made available for processing for use by, by current disabled readers. Now that dwarfed by a magnitude of 50, all of the books held by Learning Ally, Bookshare, National Library Service for the Blind, and others that had been formed to support these communities. So real quick, you see how mass digitization just overnight transformed or made possible more access. Now, what we did about that was to create a service that we now call the Accessible Text Request Service. We work directly with disability service experts at universities and colleges to help them get materials into the hands of their students who they understand have particular needs. They work with those students who and, and help them understand how to use the material and the tools that they have available to them. Uh, and we do this in the United States and we do it in Canada, the United Kingdom, and we can do it in other countries that have uh, ratified the Marrakesh Treaty for access uh, for published works for persons who are blind. We've also been working with our colleagues at the National Federation of the Blind to continue trying to expand this access to blind users around the, around the country. Now, this has by no means solved the accessible book problem, uh, but it has helped put a dent in it and it's helped raise the visibility of the problem. But we've also had hiccups along the way. Um, some of these challenged our ability to do this. In 2011, uh, we were sued. Uh, everybody gets sued at some point, it seems like, if you're in this business. Uh, the Authors Guild challenged our ability to even create, much less store and use digitized books. Now, we won that case easily. We won it at the district court, we won it at the federal appeals court, and we won it in a way that left no doubt, right? That what we do in libraries when we scan works is serving a social purpose, and it's a social purpose that is fair use. You see here the quote from the circuit judge uh, in our case. Uh, and I just want to say here, Rooster knows this, it sucks to be sued. It's a huge time suck. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, but in this case, we all got something out of it because these court cases and the Hockey Trust case and the Google case with Authors Guild made clear that digitization could lead to transformative uses of books and transformative uses of books could be quintessentially fair uses. Did a I want to thank the Authors Guild for suing us and giving us this opportunity to clarify these points for the whole world. Um, you know, what I want to also do then is talk about what these fair uses look like. And scholars were really chomping at the bit to get at the materials that Google was producing, that IA was producing in the, 2000, in the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, and so that's another challenge that we felt we had to try to face in, in Heidi Trust. Um, uh, supporting machine learning and scholarly applications against the entire corpus. Research Center in 2011, it's based at Indiana University and the University of Illinois. They offer several services, including a suite of a platform to go in and access a suite of tools that allow you to do text mining and data and some uh, uh, machine analysis on small parts of the corpus. If you're a power user and a really advanced researcher, we have secure computing environments where you can access any item in the collection without regard to copyright and run your analyses for your own purposes. And then we also produce secondary data sets that are available for use by anyone. Uh, these are essentially large collections of metadata at the page level about the contents of these works. Now, why do we do this? Um, you know, if you walk through a library and you look at the enormity of the collection, Think about the heterogeneity found in that collection. You think about the wide range of authors and perspectives and subjects expressed in hundreds of languages from multiple eras, from multiple geographies. It, you cannot get your head around that as an individual, right? How can you find a way to help this collection tell stories about ourselves? How can we begin to wrestle with that kind of magnitude? 
this is the purpose of the research center and this kind of computational analysis. And I only have time to cite just really one example in depth uh, because of time, but I wanna take you to that right now and talk with you about the work done by Richard Jean So, who's a professor of English at McGill University. Um, Richard really emphasizes the need to step back and look at large patterns at a cult, large cultural scale through collections like these. Um, in his book, Redlining Culture, he points out that there is a real uh, history of second half of 20th century literature, second half of the 20th century publishing that is contrary to the popular narrative. The real history, the, the narrative we tell ourselves in the second half of the 20th century, it's, it's the era of civil rights, increasing multiculturalism, the rise of ethnic literature and the acceptance of those authors. However, Richard shows that in fact, whiteness really claimed hegemony over the publishing industry in the second half of the 20th century, just as it had before. Um, he really ups and upends received wisdom here. He points out that Random House, one of the most well-known commercial publishers in the second 50 years of the last century published only 3% of their authors were, were non-white. 97% of their authors were white. This has a huge impact on what people are actually reading. Richard then goes in depth looking at 1400 novels uh, out of the Hathi Trust Corpus published by Random House to do an in-depth analysis to understand how racial characteristics are discussed and portrayed. He uses a methodological approach that's known as word embeddings. He quantifies how certain modes of description and characterization become associated in, uh, with ways we portray dimensions of identity in fiction. Uh, and in fact, what he finds is that in this, in this work writ large, American white identity emerges as one that's dynamic and intellectual and creative. And that's in contrast to blackness and other forms of identity which emerge less so, more flat, uninteresting, and at times sinister. So that's the narrative that gets told through our fiction in the second half of the 20th century while we are actively trying to change the world through our legislation and, and, and other act activism. Um, this is really depressing to read, but it's necessary work to help us understand what is at play in our collections, the collections that we're preserving and making accessible today. Um, I wanna note here towards the end that um, Karen Body has a really useful thing for us to think about in digital libraries. And that is that the scale of what we manage in our digital libraries can give the impression, a false impression of completion and of comprehension that is actually obscuring what's not there. Right? You can actually get the impression you can find anything so you don't think about what you're not seeing. Uh, and if you think about what Richard told us and is, is telling us in his book that so many works were published by, by white authors, you know, Random House is the kind of publisher whose works almost always get bought by libraries and end up in their collections. So what didn't make it into the publisher catalogs and what didn't make it into the library collections and thus what didn't make it onto the scanning beds? Um, not everyone has access to the means of creation and distribution of their work. The internet hasn't changed that. In fact, it's really done a lot to reinforce those barriers over the last decade in particular. Now, I don't wanna end on a bummer, right? I really don't. I, wanna just, I actually do wanna say that we need to continue to push on the work that we're doing. We need to continue to work to create accessible content for impaired readers. We need to facilitate its creation where, we, where it's necessary. But as we look at digitizing the next 20 to 30 million books, I think we should ask some more questions. What aren't we digitizing? What aren't we doing instead? What are we not able to find? Uh, what are the economic or political forces that are constraining our choices and are the corrective measures that we can take? Let's definitely celebrate the accomplishments and let's also understand what we've done so far who these libraries are for, what they represent, and the kinds of knowledge they may not include. So thanks very much. I look forward to talking with the rest of you for the rest of this afternoon. Thank you so much, Michael. And we look forward to the day when we too will say thank you to the four publishers for suing us, for clarifying all <laughs> I hope no one's here from the organization, so I don't have to talk to them <laughs> later about that. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, Google Books was sued by the Authors Guild, Hathi Trust was sued by the Authors Guild. Both of those organizations prevailed. And uh, as Brewster mentioned, we are now facing a lawsuit of our own from four of the largest mega publishers. So to be continued. Uh, next, um, you know, I think when we think about books and information online, in reality, how many of us really turn to a book when we need something? And how many of us turn to something called Wikipedia? I mean, when we talk about H.G. Wells's vision of this global encyclopedia online, this global world brain, well, 65 years later, along came Wikipedia. 
and it is my pleasure to introduce to you Moriel Schottlender. She is the Principal System Architect for Wikimedia Foundation, and she's here to talk about some of the biggest questions that that organization and the world faces. How do you fight disinformation and misinformation, and how do you improve knowledge equity, and how do digital books play into that? So please welcome Moriel Schottlender. Thank you, and it's really great being here. Give me one second as I make sure that I share my screen properly. The new realities of the web. I hope that you all see this. So thank you, I'm really excited to be here and talk about the tremendous impact that digitization has, especially on Wikipedia, as to fight misinformation and improve the knowledge equity. Before I, I go there, I'm Moriel. I'm a systems uh, architect. And as part of my role, my team is thinking about the modernization of Wikipedia, but it's not just the modernization of Wikipedia, it's what is the future of knowledge? What is knowledge going to look like in the future? What is the consumption of knowledge going to look like and looks like today? And how are we going to adjust to that? And those are really big questions and require a lot of thought and a lot of arguments. But there's one thing that's really clear out of all of that. Digitization and enabling access to books and sources is a really big part of how we move towards the future. And making those resources available to anyone online is key. And this is really what we're striving for, right? So like the Internet Archive, um, we at the Wikimedia Foundation have this mission. Imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. This is a big, big goal that we have. And one of the primary things that we're using to, to do that is Wikipedia as, as a way to disseminate and have everybody contribute to knowledge. So Wikipedia is worldwide and open. Anyone can edit. That can be experts and professionals, but that can also be students and anywhere else. In fact, you who are watching this right now can go and edit things on Wikipedia, either add articles, fix typos, verify the information and add more. And the reason this works so well is because the communities we have have created also high standards for how we make sure that we retain and maintain a high standard for factual information. And the key to that are citations. Verifiable citations that anyone can access no matter what. And you know, this is really important, especially today in our current climate of disinformation and misinformation online. This information can be so impactful and really pervasive, and it's really difficult to mitigate for many websites. It's also very damaging, as we can see now. And yet, Wikipedia again and again is proving itself to be a beacon of valid factual information. And this is because of the high standards of the community regarding citations. So when we talk about citations in Wikipedia, there are three main principles. The first is verifiability. So all citation, everything that it appears, all the information in all of the articles must be backed up by a reliable source. That reliable source must be neutral. It can't be one that pushes some agenda. And they all have to be transparent. So everything is publicly viewable and accessible. And this is where these type of projects, the Million Book Project, the digitization of books comes in with such an impact on Wikipedia. So when we talk directly about the connection we have with the Internet Archive, there are two main things that we see on Wikipedia all over the place. The first one, of course, we kind of mentioned in the beginning is the Wayback Machine. That helps us fortify links in this uh, uh, current uh, reality today of changing Internet and changing information. So we use that to make sure that all the, all the citations we use online are valid, no matter how much time passed or what kind of information changed. But of course, the book repository provides verifiable citation that anyone can access at any given moment, no matter where they are in the world. And this is incredibly important. This is what gives takes us from that citation needed uh, meme that we saw before to this situation of citation found. This is how we make sure that all the information is really valid and reliable on Wikipedia. And so this is an, a nice meme. I don't know if uh, you probably saw it online before. I kind of changed it a little bit. And it's true and all of that, but you know, there's a lot more into this than just the validity of data, which is very important. Um, but there's also an aspect here about 
access to data and knowledge equity. So if our goal is that everyone in the world should be able to contribute to the sum of all knowledge, but not everyone has equal access to knowledge, to books, to journals, to libraries, to educational materials. So we risk losing the voices that have less access from all of the other knowledge that all of us consume. And that is a big risk. And again, this is where digitization comes in. And this is how we use digitization to increase the equity. There are two main points uh, that I'll, I'll kind of talk about. So the first one is fortifying the citations of Wikipedia. So imagine, <coughs> excuse me, imagine um, you are seeing a citation. You're reading something on Wikipedia and you're checking out the citation. Where does this information come from? And you're looking at the citation. Well, you need to write down this book and you need to go and look for it now. Maybe you don't have quick access to a library. You need to drive to the library, go to the library, hope it's open, hope nobody took the book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get there, you verify the information, you found a little error. Well, now you need to fix that information and, and link it back. Not anymore. Digitization of books allow us to make sure that everybody on the spot can see exactly, not only that book, but that page that the reference exactly talks about. We even have a bot that goes around Wikipedia and fixes up those uh, citations to make sure that they are linked properly to online books that people can immediately access. You can then also borrow it, read the entire context of the book, and potentially add more information based on that book, not just for this citation. This is incredibly powerful. This means that anyone can immediately verify any information on Wikipedia. The second point here is that we're expanding the diversity of voices that are contributing. So as an example, we have groups like Wiki Women in Red. This is a group, an interest group that uh, is charged with transforming what we call red links, which are links that don't have articles, uh, to blue links, which are links that do have articles. And they do that on topics about women primarily to decrease the gender gap on Wikipedia. So already a lot of information about prominent women in history, especially in a little bit more of an older history, it's a little harder to get resources about. A lot of those are written in books. They're not written online. There's not a lot of information in blogs or online things. So having that information in the form of digitized books means that now we can add that information in a valid way to Wikipedia to share everyone and to increase uh, the amount of um, equitable information that we have. And in fact, this works so well that of all the biographies specifically in the English Wikipedia, we've increased the number of biographies about women to the point where it's almost 20% and it keeps rising. So we're making progress uh, exactly with this. So I said that there are two points that I'm going to talk about. I kind of cheated. There's in fact three points, but the third one is one that was underlying to the other two. So I'm gonna cheat away, say the third one is providing equitable access to the knowledge for diverse communities. There are communities all over the world in different cultures and languages that contribute to Wikipedia either in English or in their own languages or both. In some places, access to libraries and physical books is extremely limited, and in some places it may be limited by the government. There are also languages that are not covered in your local library and some more potentially obscure topics or hobbies that are hard to get access to information from. The digitization of books allows these communities to participate on an equal footing with the rest of the world. Not only that, we get to have their information, their expertise shared with us. And so we're exposed to a lot more knowledge and a lot more information that otherwise we wouldn't have been. And this is how we get to this picture here. Imagine a world where every single human being can really freely share in the sum of all knowledge. We have better better societies and better democracies when we have more access to knowledge. And whatever enables this is awesome. Thank you so much to the Internet Archive and to all of those various projects of digitization of books, because we can't wait to see what this enables in the future even further. Thank you so much, Moriel. You know, I was uh, reminded at the first uh, installment of this yesterday at CMU, Carnegie Mellon, that when we talk about 
digital libraries full of millions of books, who is actually using those? And Mike Seamus said, well, these are libraries created for bots. The average human who's an avid reader can read about 3000 books, but it's bots like Wikipedia's that goes across and hooks up these links to citations that are, are really using these massive, massive collections. So thank you. Thank you. That brings us to a time uh, when we can address some of your questions. So I'm going to ask all of the, uh, the folks to come back and we're going to highlight you so you'll be on screen. And let's tackle some of these very good questions from our audience. And I'm just thrilled to see that we also have uh, representatives from Google Books. So, you know, we're going to let you unmute perhaps and, and answer some of these if we don't know the answers. But let's start with the question um, that's a little meta. Is in 2021, the definition of what we mean by book, is that changing? What do you think? Well, it's been, uh, my first reaction is that uh, it, we use this general term work uh, and I'm, uh, rather than book because uh, work is very, very, uh, covers a lot more territory. So it includes videos and games and all kinds of other potentially digitizable things. Uh, but I think that the way we consume the works that we used to call books is different now than it was before because we've introduced these online environments and these computer-based tools. And so um, I think we should, in fact, seek to redefine what we mean when we say book so as to uh, incorporate all of the different ways in which that work can be used, uh, which is far beyond the purely static, uh, but wonderful invention of Gutenberg. Just to add that in special collections, you know, the idea of a book has always been a big question mark uh, from a something like a palm leaf manuscript to a tablet, a cuneiform tablet to a tally stick, uh, a work or a text, these, these things, these information carriers uh, don't always fit into the traditional idea of a text or a book. So for me, uh, the thing that I think we want to preserve going forward is the long form narrative, the long form full argument. So not just a TED talk or just a, a, a blog post or an essay, but somebody that really wants to go and argue a point and has the length to be able to go and pull that off. That's the key thing. And uh, um, by not having these really be woven into the web yet and still sort of in these endless lawsuits, um, we've got a problem um, because that's how society, we think things through. Um, so I think it's very, very important that at least the long form narrative, whether it's a codex going forward, you know, bound journal, you know, bound paper or not, nah, um, but long form narratives that are well thought through single author prognostications of a point of view, I think both in fiction and nonfiction, um, that's what I would like to see um, move forward um, in, into our digital world. Well, perhaps it is unfair to ask this group of, of book-centric folks this question, but one of our audience members asked, how do we address the information needs of mainly oral societies? Yeah, I was going to, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I was going to um, kind of connect that to, to the previous question as well. I in my vision, what I'd like to see is long narrative. I agree with you, Brewster. What I think would happen is not so much that though. I think that we're moving towards very interesting short form uh, everything. We see online, there's a lot of very quick attention, um, too fast sometimes, and then people delve in. I wonder what this means and how we can adjust to that in the area era where um, your TV speaks to you in a tiny little like quick thing and you have VR and AR and, um, your fridge suddenly displays information about like the nutrition of stuff. Like there are things that are very quick and I wonder how we can adjust to that. And then maybe from that, send people to a longer form, which I hope will stay. Cause I agree that it should, but I'm, I'm wondering how that will impact the way that we think about knowledge in general and how that knowledge comes from the books and being distributed to people. On the smaller, um, oh gosh. 
shouldn't step in front of Raj, uh, uh, Raj Reddy and, and, uh, and Vincer. But I'd like to just tip my hat to Balki and to a lot of the Indians uh, in their digitization project of really focusing on smaller languages throughout India. Even though we didn't have the technology to go and do the OCR on them, they did them anyway. And it's fabulous. Um, that doesn't necessarily get you to the ones that are primarily um, oral, but now we have the technologies to do some of those recordings and to go um, preserve them and make use of them. Um, and the Million Books Project, by, by starting out with not just, let's just do commercially viable things, it's no, let's go and represent the, all of the world's voices that has set this project and all of us. And Google has done an amazing job of doing um, OCR and translation on a broad range of languages. But we're still missing OCR on Balinese, for instance, spoken by 3 million. And we, they've been the first uh, language that I know of um, that has said everything ever written in Balinese can go online. Um, so we have lots still to do, um, but it was put in the right cast, I would say, by Raj Reddy and his collaborators and Balki and the Indian um, uh, group that uh, really did a lot of hard work in the early days. Vint, would uh, you like to comment? Yes, thank you. I wanted to make four comments. First of all, I draw your attention to Ismail Sergeldin, who was the founder of the Library of Alexandria, the third instance of that library, uh, way back in 2000 in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. He has a, uh, an annual event called The Future of the Book, which I would draw attention to. The second person is Froda Hedlund, uh, who is a protege of uh, Douglas Engelbart, uh, who does an annual event called The Future of Text. Uh, and has been inventing uh, new technology in order to make it possible to consume and produce text in ways that are more flexible than traditional. Third, uh, to respond specifically to literacy, the oral, A-U-R-A-L, uh, consumption of books, either, um, either by recorded by humans or even generated by, uh, uh, by bots, uh, is a way of trying to cope in part with the literacy question. And the last point I offer is that uh, we're seeing an interesting phenomenon at YouTube, which is that people uh, will type in questions either to Google search or YouTube saying, how do I do X for some value of X? And they get a five minute video or a three minute video or maybe a longer one uh, to answer that question. And so what we're seeing is people using these online environments to get answers to questions when they need them. So this is just in time learning. It's not not a substitute for intense and long study and long form content, but it's a very interesting phenomenon for drawing people in uh, to learn more. Dr. Reddy, you have to unmute. To me, um, we shouldn't just knowledge in many different forms, newspapers, you know, I would, and there, there was a project called 1,000 Newspapers or 10,000 Newspapers for 10,000 Years. It would be great if we can capture every newspaper that's already born digital and keep it for future generations. And I showed you music and, uh, and video and, uh, and paintings. All of them are in copyright. The issue is because they're in copyright, they're getting lost you know, ultimately, because nobody's putting them in a, in a repository, which would ultimately become public domain. Right now, it's not the case. So we need to somehow think, actually, Wikipedia should think, and the, and the public library should think about how, how do we add these other media, paintings and music and movies uh, into, the, into the mix? I think that would be wonderful. I have another question uh, for this group, and uh, I think it, it is um, following up on what Mike Furlow had to talk about. Uh, they're saying, what, um, sorry, I've lost my question. Oh, how is non-text material being handled for the blind and visually impaired reader? Mike, do you, can you tackle that? 
Um, I can try. I mean, I know that um, my knowledge of this is not complete. Uh, so if there are any folks in the, in the audience who want to share more in chat, I would, I would welcome that. Um, I think in the last decade, I've seen a lot more intensive attention paid uh, by publishers uh, and, and the content industry in general to captioning and description, uh, especially let's talk about just published works for a second, a book, you know, that, um, you know, finding ways of more richly describing illustrations in a work so that the reader uh, who is sight impaired has an opportunity to better understand what is depicted there and how it illustrates the arguments of, of the text. Um, you know, this is another version of what you see in PowerPoint now if you're encouraged to put in alt text, right? Uh, the, the trick is that's incredibly expensive. And if in certain fields, like, you know, particularly in the sciences and maybe even in arts, uh, his, art history, for example, uh, the kind of description necessary to be useful in that is, it's, I think it's really up for grabs. And it's challenging right now for people to find ways of doing that in an affordable manner. Video is similar in that um, uh, I'm aware of at least a few libraries that have um, been trying to make headway on uh, machine captioning of video materials that are in their archives for, uh, for, uh, for um, uh, hearing impaired uh, viewers. And uh, that is, you know, that's variable depending upon your sound quality there. I mean, I am kind of heartened because I do feel like over the last several years, this, there's definitely been more attention paid to accessibility and publishing. Um, I don't think it's quite broken through at the commercial level and the major commercial level in the same way it has uh, in the academic side. Uh, and I also say that the higher up the chain towards the higher end commercial material you go, the more likely people are looking to protect their uh, their assets, as, as you were, uh, and, uh, you know, are, are maybe less attentive to the needs of, of some of the users that you see on the ground level there. Anyway, that's, that's sort of my take on that right now, so. Thank you. Anyone else want to tackle that? Okay, go ahead, Vint. Um, I just put a little note in the chat. Uh, one thing that's starting to emerge is an interest in generating audio description for visual materials, as, as is often uh, now not enough, but sometimes done for uh, videos, for example, so that or even broadcast television, so uh, someone who's blind can understand what's going on in the field of view. Uh, the ability to use text to speech. Uh, can be an interesting way of assisting there because you could have a text-based description of what's going on and have it spoken because we have very good quality text-to-speech and increasingly we have the ability to translate that text-to-speech into more than uh, the original language but into other languages as well. Thank you. I'd like to read a comment from John O'Connor. Bloom. He writes that one accomplishment of Raj Reddy's Universal Library project that hasn't yet been mentioned is that it was the first to start digitizing historic copyright renewal records after Congress last extended copyright terms. And that led digitization projects more easily identify things that are actually in the public domain, but not obviously so. So Raj's project has done much more than digitized books. It was actually Brewster that did most of the work. Oh, no. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad to hear John say this because uh, we got the digitized images uh, from him. And then Project Gutenberg, we made a prize to go and key it all in. And the Project Gutenberg people did all of that. Now Stanford has gone and put a database around it, and it's now used by everybody. And it all sort of been handed off you know with no license agreements no sort of let's sign ndas it's just like no let's get something done here i'm now on a, a committee for the copyright office where they're contemplating digitizing those records it's like oh come on um so we, we there the community has has rallied to do uh some of this work in a very collaborative way but john it's uh, interesting to hear where the images actually came from i thought they came from you <laughs> mike what would you like to add? I would just add, I, I want to uh, add to the circle of congratulations wherever they're due on this all, all through the chain, because uh, this database that we've, or this data that eventually made its way into the Stanford database has been something we've been using for 10 years now to, to research copyright status works that are uh, that we're apparently in 
copyright, but which in the United States actually were not renewed or never, never actually had copyright protection. So we've, I think we've reviewed something on the order of about 800,000 works and more than half of those have been opened up as public domain as a result of that. And all that's been done by individuals uh, volunteering time to do that kind of work. So thanks all the way down to the bottom uh, of the chain on that one. A little known fact, I do believe that Brewster Kale coined the term orphan works. And those are works that we're not really sure what the copyright status is. So they hang in a kind of copyright limbo of access. Here's another question. Um, what aren't we digitizing? Liz, do you want to take a crack at that? Yes, uh, from a special collections perspective, I know uh, some things are a little bit more difficult to offer, uh, things that can't be OCR, for example, or items of ephemera. Uh, as Michael was saying in his presentation, um, you know, what even ends up in the library, uh, it has to be in the library in order to get onto the scanning bed in order to be scanned, and it has to be worth the scanning for someone. So uh, as the commenter mentioned, there is the elements that are purely oral, but there's also material that might not generally be considered worth uh, scanning, you know, like things that are slips of paper, manuscripts that end up inside of books, posters and flyers that are uh, up for a week and removed, uh, that are um, not part of the mainstream publishing process, that, but are part of the cultural history. As you mentioned, Liz, one of the most popular books from EOT is that knitting patterns book, like who's to say what is really going to be of interest to, to humanity over time? Brewster? Some of the challenging things right now are things that are uh, licensed uh, and protected with digital copyright, uh, digital protection measures. So I guess in the last um, uh, uh, award ceremony, academic uh, um, Academy Award ceremony, about half of the movies were just stream only. And those are things that will never be in a library collection physically because they may not ever hit DVD. Um, so those are a problem. Um, social media um, has, uh, is kind of an issue. Um, and a lot of the um, works like uh, some of the important things like textbooks um, because they've got so many lawyers all standing around trying to keep people from being able to analyze them. Um, right, because we want to be able to analyze these and, and go through some of the, uh, the the types of work that uh, was happened with Random House, but you know, step close to uh, to these things and uh, and landmines blow up. Um, so often, really culturally important materials are the ones that are going to be denied to the next generation or analyses. It's 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 really not it's not right. One thing I'd like to throw in on this, uh, this picks up a little bit on, on Liz's point about what's not stuff that doesn't ever make it in the library. Um, I, I wanna call out the work of an organization called Documenting the Now. And the folks who uh, are involved with that are also involved with an organization called the Ship Collective. And that is an organization that really works to help communities build their own archives of their own history and their own stories and tell their own stories. Powerful set of work uh, or accumulation of work that they have done. So we're talking about, you know, local micro histories, local communities who are documenting, uh, you know, their own uh, story of evolution or perhaps, uh, you know, radical political acts that have happened in their presence or have helped shape those communities. Stuff that might not make it into a library, maybe it will at one point, but, you know, the, the point is to help those communities tell their own story and to kind of take control of the ability to, to weave that narrative. And it's a real challenge, I think, to the authority of libraries, archives, and museums, and it's one we do well to tend to learn from and find ways of supporting as well to the extent we can. Our next question has to do with authors. Do you have any advice for authors about how to re recoup costs and make an income and still make our books available digitally? Yeah, there are at least two mechanisms that we should look into. One is uh, the idea of a public lending right. If it turns out you created a, a work that lots of people are accessing, in countries like England, they set aside 4 million pounds annually to kind of track whose books are being checked out and give them a check between 
10, 10 pounds to 10,000 pounds. I think uh, if, uh, if someone is creating work that might be interesting to other people, I think you begin, you're beginning to see this even here. There's a book uh, by uh, Blum and Cannon and, um, about data science, foundations of data science. They published it for free as a PDF on, online. And then they are also selling it for a fee as a hard copy. I'm beginning to see more and more of those things where uh, you put it online for free. And in fact, National Press, National Academy Press does that. They publish all their reports for free uh, online. You can download them. But if you want a hard copy, you can buy them. Anyway, so I think there are new regimes that are coming up where people understand internet is actually a marketing device. You're marketing your thing, you know, instead of saying, look inside like Amazon does for 10% of the book or something, you can give them the whole book, you know, and then if they, if they really like it, they will buy it. You know. It's not a, not a big deal. There are many libraries that want to buy ebooks and uh, the publishers are saying, no, you cannot buy them. And there are many cases saying they cannot buy them under any license terms at all. Um, the, um, yeah. So insist, uh, and maybe indie publishers, uh, PM Press, there's others that are now actively selling books to libraries such as the Internet Archive. And we'd like to see more libraries buy books uh, from those publishers that support purchasing. I mean, it may sound you know, kind of wild to go and say, I'm actually like, let's try capitalism here um, rather than sort of what it is that's going on right now in, uh, in the publishing world. And it's screwing authors completely. So when you check out an ebook from your public library, what's happened is that your public library has taken out a subscription or a license for that book. And uh, oftentimes they'll have to pay per person who um, checks it out and there's limits. And once 26 people have checked it out, they no longer have that book. So you can imagine a time 20 years from now when you go to the digital shelves and boy, your book's not going to be on that shelf anymore because it won't be the hot new book that your public library can afford to subscribe to. Just like Netflix is not going to have that movie of 20 years from now. And I think what Brewster is saying is that libraries like the Internet Archive want to be able to buy an ebook and hold that for, for all time. So those are, those are some of the battles kind of going on right now uh, behind the scenes. Uh, another question is... Um, is there a wiki that covers all books, books in general that are not perhaps notable enough to be added to Wikipedia? Openlibrary.org uh, attempts to be a wiki of, um, of books and people can add books and change the metadata and, and the like. Um, and it's, um, it's specifically uh, built for, for that purpose. And it's, modifiable. It was uh, architected by Aaron Schwartz uh, and has continued to be supported by um, a user community as well as the Internet Archive. There's also Wikisource uh, that exists in multiple languages uh, around the world that uh, primarily uh, then transliterates the text uh, back into uh, digital form in the wiki. Uh, so that's another option. Here's a what question. Oh, what go would, ahead. What would be useful, uh, Brewster, is there are supposed to be these 130 million books. If we can at least capture the titles of all the books and titles and authors of all those books, so we can search it and see if there's anything public, ever published that might be of interest to me. And then we can figure out how to go about getting it digitized and whatever we need to do. And many things might be already born digital. And so the question is, uh, how do we get the list of all the books? Here's a provocative question. What about the blockchain and NFTs? How does this play into the future of books and content? I'm going to take the provocative stance of I'm pro NFTs, registering things on blockchains, um, going and um, making 
materials more available in a more distributed way. Um, the Internet Archive has been a big proponent of, net, of decentralized web technologies where it's kind of going backwards to the libraries. Publishers would go and publish a book and it would be bought bought, really bought um, by libraries, and it would be placed in those libraries. So if any of those libraries happen to disappear, we're still likely to have another copy someplace else. That's not the way the web works. The web works such that it's on one place. And if it goes down or they change the URLs, it's effectively gone. And the Wayback Machine is a kludge to try to fix the, that broken nature of the web. And the um, idea of the decentralized web, whether it's Filecoin, uh, the blockchain um, technologies, the NFT is just the simplest, stupidest little demo project, right? It's just trying to register a hash code. Um, so I think it's just the beginning of, of what we'd like to see happen is decentralizing uh, the storage so you can find things from multiple places. Going and having it in just one place, even if the Internet Archive is kind of awesome, don't depend on just one place. And the blockchain technologies is good. The hash technologies that are underneath things like uh, BitTorrent are fabulous. Um, let's go and invest more into these technologies um, to um, make it so that we register things. Oh, yeah, let's fix that damn power problem. Um, that's that's just dumb. Let's just fix that. So uh, it's Vint. Uh, so Brewster and I uh, usually align, but here we don't and we part ways to some extent. Um, in this case, uh, I'm not persuaded that blockchain is a solution to everything. It's sort of the 21st century drill frame. Uh, I do take the point of the distribution of copies is a good idea because that does create um, you know, uh, resilience as long as you can find it, uh, which is important. The problem with blockchain is that it doesn't contain the object. It just contains references to it. And uh, so it's still the, the digital thing is someplace else, not in the blockchain itself. So we should be careful about uh, distinguishing that from say the BitTorrent notion where there are multiple instances to draw from. Uh, as to NFTs, um, I am unpersuaded that this is anything other than the tulip craze. The tulip craze, yes. Um, I wanted to add something to this uh, because Vint uh, and Brewster were there when we launched the first decentralized web summit in 2016. And uh, blockchain is one thing, but there's also now decentralized storage, like storage and Filecoin. And so when Filecoin launched its main net, we put on that rocket ship, uh, they like to use rocket metaphors, we put the LibriVox books and the Prelinger films. So should anything happen to the internet archive, now across thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of computers, the LibriVox audiobooks live on. So we are doing some major experimentation. We're, we're the first actually to look at what it means to do decentralized storage of the actual items at scale. So stay tuned for that. Well, you know, I think that it is time to turn our attention to what we call the big bet. Now I, came to understand that Raj Reddy is not only famous for AI, not only famous for the uh, project, he is famous for something called the big bet of the future. He will make a bet with his friends that in 10 years or 20 years, such and such a thing will happen. And people actually put up real money or real dinners against Raj's vision. So we want to play this game today to close out our time together. So Raj, we want you to make a prognostication, a, 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 a bet for 2031. What do you think will happen to digital books or digital libraries by 2031? I wanted Brewster to make this bet because I may not be around, <laughs> but uh, I'm happy to make it. I, you, you may not be able to collect it from me, but uh, we'll see. Uh, by one, the thing that uh, many of us have been fighting is the copyright problem and the lawsuits and so on. And I think we are at a point where the, the society is beginning to realize that the current copyright law is broken. And in a world of digital copyrights, we need you know, something better. So my, my 
aspiration and bet is by in 10 years, by 2031, we'll have a frictionless streamlined copyright regime in which authors can extend the copyright indefinitely if they want by paying a prescribed fee. If Disney wants Mickey Mouse, they can extend it beyond 100 years, but they may have to pay a million dollars at the 100 years. But, but there is, at the beginning, there'll be no fee to register. The second is users of copyrighted material can get access to the material for fair use in less than five minutes and not be worried about you know, lawsuits and so on. And by paying a required fee, uh, as specified by the metadata uh, for single copy use. If the copyright is not registered with the National Digital Library uh, Copyright Registry with relevant metadata and mandatory digital deposit, then the fines for copyright violations of unregistered copyright material will, should be nominal, like $1. Yes, you know, you get a moral victory, but you're not going to get a lot of money out of it. This will put all the lawyers out of business. Yes, but at least the copyright lawyers that are suing, you know, Google and uh, Internet Archive. So that, and the, the bet is that, that the community of the people speakers here uh, will kind of either agree or disagree that this will happen in 10 years that will have a streamlined copyright regime. And the, the, the losers will treat the winners to the rest, uh, dinner at the most expensive restaurant in San Francisco chosen by the winners. And they get to choose where that we all get to eat. So <laughs> since, since I not, may not be around, I'm going to send $1,000 to Brewster and he can <laughs> pay my share. All right. I'm going to place a bet that in 2031, Raj Reddy is around and he's going to have to pay up on his bets anyway. But here it is, folks. The creation of a national digital registry where there's mandatory copyright registry. And uh, if you want to extend the copyright, you can do it for 100 years as long as you pay a fee. But the real bet is that we're going to make a streamlined, frictionless copyright regime so that any user online within five minutes for a fee can get access to the great works of humanity. Right. That is Raj's, Raj's decade-long vision. Vint, what do you have to say about that? I will take the bet uh, negative. In other words, I will bet against Raj and hope to lose. $10,000 <laughs> on the table. Where do I send it? Send it to 300 Funston. <laughs> Internet Archive. Um, I'm going to vote yes, um, and, and um, I'm going to help try to make it come true. I, what did Alan Kay say? The best way of uh, predicting the future is make it happen. Is let's let's go and come up. Let's take Raj's vision here and make it come true. Who should argue against a streamlined system where fair uses are easy, uh, where compensation is understood, where there's registration and um, the actual copyrighted materials are in repositories that are uh, long-term protected. Let's just do this thing. I mean, Raj, hey. you're doing it again. So right. I'm going to vote you? yes, even Brewster. if it costs me a dinner. Brewster, it's been, uh, let me point out that the bet against it is not being against the idea. It's against whether it happens by 2031. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, right. So, then I want to ask you, since you've put ten thousand dollars on the table, what do you think would prevent this vision from happening in the next decade? Uh, resistance uh, in the publishing industry, the sluggish processes of government, a whole variety of, of things which impede progress. Yeah, I agree with Vint. I, I still think it'll happen, but social systems are notoriously slow. They don't move very fast. And uh, so it might happen in 20 years, but then so do uh, you know, many other things, you know, where we know it's going to happen, it may take a little longer than we think. Right, we have one, one for and one against. Others, place your bets. 
I will stand uh, on the side of the vent and betting against it. I'm not going to bet $10,000, though, because I, I think more valuable after the apocalypse will be this box of matches. So when all your blockchain is gone, you'll have these matches to help light the way. Uh, but I think also, I, I, I actually like some of the characteristics that Raj described there, because it, in a way, it, it reminds me of uh, proposals to do uh, collective licensing and published works but with a lot more um, accountability to the creator or the rights holder side than I think I've seen in other. In other. So it really has some merits there, but like, like Bent, I, um, I feel a little more pessimistic about social and, and legal change on this front, so. All right, two to one against. Liz and Morial. Hi, yeah, that's a, I don't know. I tried to think about this to prepare and I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm flipping. Um, well, I can't really, you know, if we're talking about the expensive uh, restaurant in San Francisco, I work for a nonprofit. I don't know if I'll, you know, maybe like a, a little tiny, you know, like a salad in the beginning. A, a so burrito. Yeah. So whichever <laughs> side, I'm kind of like, well, um, but I, I don't know. I, I hope this will be true, but I, I'm kind of skeptical about the same kind of thing, like the processes. What I think might help this um, is that I think that the way that we think about a lot of this changes. Um, as, as we move on, we've seen this with, you know, if you talk about um, even software, like it used to be that people were, people would worry about like, I can't put my software online because people will steal it. And now you see it all the time and people don't really steal it. Like it's not, it's not really like, it's not as horrible that people thought. And I think that we might potentially see something like that also happening with just the way that we think about works online and where to put them, um, which will maybe aid your vision in coming. So I'm hoping, um, I, I don't know, I'm gonna put myself on the side of, sure, why not? It'll happen and we'll just order. I, I won't be able to pay for the meal though, so. <laughs> That's okay. Burritos are good too, Muriel. So two for and two against and uh, Liz, you get the tie breaking vote. I will go against my natural pessimism and vote for uh, because I would love to see that happen, especially considering the events of the past 18 months and all of the lessons that we hope will be able to be maintained more long term about accessibility and, and access to, to materials. Um, but I, Brewster, maybe you could uh, spot me the uh, money to put it to. Yeah. No, no, no problem. There, there, there's only a dinner at stake here, and I think that uh, Raj and, and uh, Vint are, are covering both sides of the uh, of the dinner. Uh, right. And uh, I would like to extend it to other people uh, out there in the, in the audience here. Um, you know, chime in a little bit on, on on this, right? I mean, do what does it take to actually make real progress on the big issue here, which is the institutional lethargy? that's going on. How do we go and take the money that is in the system? Library system spends $12 billion a year. How do we go and spend that better than what we've been doing now, which we have almost nothing to show for it um, in terms of our collections being built? What's the way forward? How do we go and make it so that authors are compensated, that there's lots of winners? We want a game with lots of winners. Um, that's what made the internet work. Um, a decentralized system at its heart, the web work, um, and let's see if we can make the book publishing industry uh, uh, work better than, than it has. Um, I think by showing the real value of digitizing that Google has done, that Raj, of course, did, that Michael Hart, you know, all the people that came um, uh, in this, the Internet Archive, all the scanning centers, the 500 libraries participating, um, we're showing the value. Now let's go and try to just make it so that it's not as frightening an environment. Okay, everyone, put it in your calendars. August 2031, we're going to get back together and see if Raj Reddy has once again bet on the future <laughs> and, and been prescient. He hasn't been wrong too often in the past. <laughs> Finally, we have one last bit of business. And uh, there is a gift that we have for Raj on his 20th anniversary of this project. So Brewster, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yes, well, Raj, um, I know that you're all, all about virtual, but we thought we'd make it physical, that we thought we would go and take the books, the, um, the million books, books that were digitized in India, 
and we're, we made them and put them onto hard drives. Um, and then um, I'm going to pass this book as a memento. So this is the text from the million books that we have from the uh, uh, libraries of India. And here I'm going to pass it up into the ether. Thank you, thank you very That's much. This is great. <laughs> I appreciate it. Can you show us the hard drives? Because uh, uh, my, yes. uh, my virtual one didn't uh, actually have them. Here are the two hard drives. Here is one. Here is another one. Did you ever imagine a million books would fit in the, the space of one book? I guess you probably did. You know, I think you know, it will fit in one if, if you buy a four terabyte. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even need two. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. This is great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Raj. You better get cracking because you got to start reading those million books now. <laughs> as, as, as Mike Shemel said, if I read a book every day, I can only read 30,000 books in my life. But I haven't read a book every day, maybe one, one every week or one every month. So I probably only read about a thousand books in my lifetime. You know? So, you know, But I think we need assist robotic assistance, you know, intelligent assistance, which will read all those books and give me appropriate quotations like you did in the Ngram example. Uh, that would be fantastic, you know, so you know, Ngram and other things so that we can say, has anybody published anything about such and such? And out comes your robot, which has read about these things, understood it, and then not a robot, you know, intelligent agent. That would be great. Well, thank you so much for your leadership. From Gutenberg to the Million Books Project to the universities and the University of Toronto to Google Books to the Internet Archive and Hathi Trust, and now into people's hands through Wikipedia, you have set in motion a tremendous, tremendous feat. So thank you. And this is not the last event to honor the Million Books Symposium, if we could pull up the uh, slide. In fact, this is day two of four days. Tomorrow, you can hear from the Digital Library of China and the day after the Digital Library of India. And I've put in the chat this URL, but you can also just search for Carnegie Mellon University Million Books Symposia, and you will come to hear more in depth from other partners as well. So on behalf of the Internet Archive, on behalf of, of all of us here, thank you to our panelists, thank you to Raj Reddy, and thank you to you in the audience for being a great, great audience. Stay tuned for, for more. Thank you. Okay.